Rivers is going to have Damian Lillard run very fast out of town. Does he help them win? You're under 500. You're Alan Judge helps the Yankees win. You're paying the players $300 million. You better be sure that that guy's going to help you get over the my co-host speedy Petey, executive producer of the show aaron fishman and our sports minute from tommy scoop 631-672-3108 is the number to call go to our website at www.worldwidesportsradio.com check out all our shows throughout the week including the loud mouth with me and speedy Petey, every single tuesdays and thursdays at 7 p.m all you have to do to tune in and check out our local listings for all our shows is go to our website at www dot worldwide sports radio dot com it's an interesting weekend and and with the heat i mean seriously it's raining it's cool out now today it was like really really hot it, it was 86 degrees here on long island it felt like it was 100 it was horrible and i i just don't like this weather so football weather hopefully will begin in the next couple of weeks as fish knows as he is a coach so uh, a lot to get into we have a lot to get into tonight when it comes to sports but um, you know, it, it's again, nothing that I have not seen before when it comes to social media, uh, at eight o'clock, we'll be talking to Colts and Broncos defensive and Daryl Reed. He will be joining us. So very excited to have him, uh, uh, Daryl Reed joining us, uh, at nine o'clock, we'll be talking to, uh, the score NBA data science manager, Seth Anchorage man part now. So, uh, I know. There's a lot of people that like him. Jeff loves him. Snug loves him. So I'm sure they're excited to get Anchorage Mana back on. I, I don't like calling him Anchorage. Just set part now. Uh, he will be joining us. Uh, I don't know why you have to put that up, but that that's just me. So, uh, yeah, we have a lot. So let, let's get into it. Uh, um, obviously, C.D. Lamb was the big story this weekend. Adam Schefter reports that the Cowboys gave C.D. Lamb a four-year, $136 million contract. This deal makes him the second-highest paid wide receiver behind Justin Jefferson and is also the second-largest contract given to somebody that is not a quarterback. The deal is $34 million per year and has a signing bonus of $38 million and $100 million guaranteed. Jerry, so Jerry Jones said he always had confidence he would get this deal done. And nobody can be better when it comes to a general manager than him. Shannon Sharp took shots at Jerry Jones, saying he wants to take credit for everything and sabotage every general manager in the NFL. Lamb had 29 catches of over 20 yards last season, tied for the most in the league by Tyreek Hill. Lamb had seven games with 11 or more catches last season, most in NFL history. C.D. Lamb, to me, and I, I said this last, oh, what was it, two, three weeks ago, I believe C.D. Lamb is the, you can argue him or Justin Jefferson are two best wide receivers in all of the NFL. C.D. Lamb was looking for that big contract over the really the last couple of weeks after Justin Jefferson received his contract by the Minnesota Vikings. You look at C.D. Lamb and you look at the talent that he brings to the table. And I've said this when he was drafted. I remember him when he was playing for Oklahoma. I know the Beave was not very excited when the Cowboys drafted him at number 17, where he fell in the draft, which made no sense because I thought he was a top five prospect at the time. C.D. Lamb has really developed into a superstar player at his position. And when you quote... That type of player. And, and he's a guy that doesn't go out there. He's not a flashy person. He doesn't, he's not that type of player. 
He doesn't go out there and speak to the press and shoot down how great he – shoot down everybody else around him and, and speaks about how great he is. He doesn't say that. He doesn't go out there and do, do that. He plays for the Cowboys, obviously center stage. As we all know, it's America's fan. I, I don't know why everybody calls him uh, the Cowboy fans, the American fan. But, hey, you know what? The Cowboys over the last couple of years have not really gotten over the hump in the playoffs. And everybody wants to blame Dak Prescott. But Jerry Jones obviously overpays players, Zeke Elliott being one of them. He brings him back after they decided to part ways with him after, what, two years? He jumps from one team to another, and he comes back to the Dallas Cowboys, making, I think, $2 million or whatever, $2.5 million this year, where he was making 16. He was the highest paid running back in the NFL. Jerry Jones has really hurt this team and their salary cap. He's overpaid players like Demarcus Lawrence, who should not be paid top dollar for a defensive line. Over the years, he's paid guys that couldn't stay healthy. Great players couldn't stay healthy. And that is the problem right now on why the Cowboys can't get over the hump. Everybody wants to blame everybody else. The Cowboy fans are one of the people or most of the reasons why people love to point their fingers at the Dallas Cowboys. Because the Dallas Cowboy fans think that they're better than they really are. But I don't think it has anything to do with the fans. It has something to do with ownership. It has something to do with the execs. They got it right this time. C.D. Lamb, who really didn't have much of a preseason, didn't have much of an OTA, could it affect him? Could it injure him early in the season? We've seen this happen to wide receivers. They sit out. They're not practicing. They're not working out with their teammates. And then they get their contract. They come in. And then what? One, two games in a season. They hurt their hamstring. They hurt their ankle and they're out a significant amount of time because their bodies are not built for the regular season. That is the only thing that could hurt the Cowboys on waiting so long to give C.D. Lamb the contract that he well deserved. But the Cowboys right now, even having C.D. Lamb, they have no depth. And that is going to be a big problem this season. Because for years, the Dallas Cowboys have been looking for that second guy. Since they really decided to part ways with Amari Cooper, they moved him, they traded him to the Browns because they knew that a couple of years later they were going to have to pay CeeDee Lamb top dollar. So what they did was move Amari Cooper, bring in some you know prospects and you know draft stock. Did it work? It didn't work for them because they have not replaced Amari Cooper. They've tried to bring in veterans. It hasn't worked. They tried to bring in youngsters to play at that position. It hasn't worked. C.D. Lamb is the only weapon the Dallas Cowboys have. I don't want to hear about Ferguson. Ferguson had a nice year last year. He's a good, competent tight end. Is he a great tight end? He's not. And we have to see him do it back-to-back years. Ferguson's been in a league for how many years? Three, four years? He's been in a league for a while. It's not like nobody knew who he was. And everybody got to know who he was this year because of who he's dating. That's about it. Now, he had a good season. But the Cowboys need more than that. You're playing in the NFC East. Yes, the the Giants are nothing to bark about right now. But even the Giants, they have one weapon. That's what makes the Cowboys so interesting. And everybody, all the Cowboy fans want to attack Dak Prescott, that he's horrible. Could you imagine having one weapon in CeeDee Lamb for the last two, two and a half, three years and being one of the best offenses in all of the NFL? Could you imagine that? Just think about that. For all you Cowboy fans that can't stand Dak Prescott, who the Cowboys have not really given him or haven't given him any top-end players besides C.D. Lamb. Just think about that. Now, I'm not trying to blow the Cowboys up, and I'm not reading. I, 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 I don't even know what Keith is writing right now. And he could say that Dak sucks. Dak does not suck. How many quarterbacks, and again, I'm going to go back to Dak Prescott, how many quarterbacks are successful in the playoffs? How many quarterbacks? Over the years, including Matthew Stafford, who was with the Detroit Lions, how long did it take Matthew Stafford to win a Super Bowl? It took a trade. Now, will the Cowboys decide to part ways with Dak Prescott? If Dak goes to another team that's already built for the playoffs and actually gives him a multiple amount of weapons, hey, maybe Dak wins a championship with that team. Because I look at Dak's career the same way I look at Matthew Stafford's career. A guy that's never going to get over the hump until he leaves that organization because that organization's been nothing but a cancer. 
Now, C.D. Lamb, to me, still, last year, was the best wide receiver in football. You could argue Tyreek Hill was right there with him. But to me, what C.D. Lamb did last year with practically nothing around him on a Cowboy team that still was rated high offensively only because of him, he did amazing things. Absolutely amazing things that a wide receiver over the last, I don't know, 25 years a, a, a Cowboy player has ever never done. And as a matter of fact, he's the first Cowboy to ever do what he did in a regular season. Michael Irvin, as great as he was, never put up the numbers that C.D. Lamb put up last year. So he deserves the money. Now, as far as Shannon Sharp is concerned, Shannon Sharp is not a GM. He's not an owner. He's a great analyst when it comes to personality and going out there. He does his show over there on YouTube. It's, it's, it's putting up over millions and millions of viewers every single time he posts something up. I think Shannon Sharp is sensational when it comes to you know, his professionalism and his personality. He doesn't know anything about being a GM. He doesn't know anything about being an owner. So for him to take shots at Jerry Jones is ridiculous. Now, is Jerry Jones a good GM? Is he a good owner? He's a good owner because he likes to overpay players. So no player is going to be complaining about that. He still opens his pockets and pays his players. And he pays his own players. He doesn't really like to go out there and overpay for other teams' players. That's something I got to give Jerry Jones a lot of credit for. But he pays players or players that he shouldn't be paying the money that he is paying them when he knows there's a salary cap and it could set his team back 10 to 12 years, which it has. And that's why the Cowboys have not gotten over the hump. And that's why the NFC is not going to go through Dallas this year. And it's not going to go through Dallas in the next couple of years because they've got nothing but one player in C.D. Lamb that's going to go up there and get the ball. Yeah, and that's a problem with Jerry Jones's comment, too. Like, oh, he's saying he, he's going to take all the credit for the GMs and steal. And Shannon Sharp's saying, oh, he's stealing all the credit from the other GMs across the league. How about stealing credit from your own son? Who, If it wasn't for them, I don't know where the Cowboys would be. I, the, the Cowboys have drafted well defensively the last couple of years in offensive line because of his son, not because of Jerry Jones wanting all these flashy picks and leaking your own draft board in 2022. Definitely wasn't a good touch for that either. And like our friend RJ Ochoa has said on many occasions, mm -hmm. They a lot of teams are smart where they use Jerry Jones, knowing that oh he was flashy, he likes to pay, pay all these players as leverage for other contracts. How many how many people have we had on this show that have said Sean Payton was going to head to the Cowboys after he left the Saints and he signs that big deal with the Broncos instead? Why? Because the Cowboys are using it as leverage. That's kind of thing. And all these other free agents that have gotten these big deals because of that use that team as leverage. That's not exactly the good look of a, a good owner or a good GM, Jerry. So if it wasn't for your son drafting all these good homegrown players, we, this team would not be where it is right now. And it's still not where you want it to be for a team that analytically has looked good in both the 2021 and 2023 seasons. They've gotten a combined one playoff win against a nine and eight Buccaneers team. That was not very good. So that's the, what you're going to be. That's what you're going to toot your own horn with Jerry, that you're a good GM and you're smarter than and, all these guys. And you know, what's so funny. I'm reading Keith and he says that Matthew Stafford is so much better than Dak Prescott. Oh, really? Dak Prescott. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, cause Keith, you obviously, you look past everything Dak Prescott has done because you hate the Cowboys and you hate Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott's played in 114 games. Matthew Stafford, 206. Dak Prescott has a better completion percentage than Matthew Stafford does in his career. He's thrown more yards in the less, in, in less games, less games played than Matthew Stafford. And Matthew Stafford's thrown 357 touchdowns in 206 games to Dak Prescott's 114 games, 202. So you're going to tell me he's much better than Dak Prescott? Numbers would tell you he's not, okay? Numbers would tell you. Now you tell me, Matthew Stafford, what did he do in the playoffs with Detroit? What did he do besides lose? Nothing. Keith, you speak garbage. When you come out, when you come out and say something, come out with some information. Don't go out there and try to attack us saying that, oh, Dak is worse than Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford is much better because he's not. He's not. He won one Super Bowl with the LA Rams. By, by the way, if Dak was the quarterback of that team, he would have won the Super Bowl too with that defense and the weapons that they have. So you don't know what you're talking about. For you to attack Dak Prescott, and I'm going to say this to all the fans out there that want to, this had nothing to do with Dak Prescott. Nothing. This take had nothing to do with Dak Prescott. But of course, there's haters out there that can't stand Dak Prescott. For what reason? I don't know. What is the hatred of this kid? 
This kid has done nothing but go out there with his mother dying before he even stepped on an NFL football field. His brother committing suicide. Him snapping his leg back when everybody said he's never going to play football again. Comes back and puts up numbers last year. 4,516 yards, 36 touchdowns, threw under 14, 13 uh, interceptions, which he said he was going to do. He wasn't going to throw more than nine, I think he said. He went out there, put up great numbers, one of the best seasons he ever had. And what do Cowboy haters want to do? What do people want to do to Dak Prescott? They want to hate on him. They want to say that he stinks. They want to say that he's not that good. Why? I don't understand. Why? Because he hasn't achieved in the playoffs? Hey, I'll tell you what. Let's go back to Troy Aikman's team. The best offensive line football's ever seen. One of the greatest defense defenses we ever seen. And by the way, the greatest quarter to ever play in the NFL, in Deion Sanders, which everybody wants to blow him up, okay? Emmitt Smith, one of the greatest running backs. Michael Irvin, one of the greatest wide receivers ever. Could we go on and on and on? You're going to tell me if Dak was on that team, he wouldn't have won a Super Bowl? What are you, nuts? It's ridiculous. Why is there so much hatred on this guy? CeeDee Lamb is the only weapon on that team. If you go to top to bottom and you look at that roster right now, it is horrible. But I can guarantee you this is going to be a top 10 offense. And why do you think it's a top 10 offense? Just C.D. Lamb? How about the offense that has been depleted, losing offensive linemen after offensive linemen over the last couple of years? And still, Dak puts up the numbers that he puts up. You think that's a winky dink You think that's a coincidence? Or how about just saying that Dak Prescott is a competent, good quarterback in the league? If you want to compare the, even the Stafford parallel to Keith, like look at all the, besides this year with the Packers, look at all the playoff losses that Dak has had recently versus the playoff losses Matthew Stafford had when he was with the Lions. Like the, the team, the 49ers were a significantly better team than the Cowboys are. And the teams the Lions lost to, the Saints and the Seahawks, those two, those are his only two playoff appearances that Matthew Stafford had to deal with that same kind of thing. So the parallel is pretty much even, Keith. So to say that Dak Prescott couldn't get to where Matthew Stafford is now, he has a lot of time left in his career. Outside of that one bad ankle injury, he's been pretty healthy. Like, to say that he can't get there at this point, especially if CeeDee Lamb's here for the long run now, and if they can pay Dak, he'll be there for the long run, too. I hope they don't pay. I hope they don't pay. I hope he goes somewhere else. You know why I hope he goes somewhere else? Because I think if he goes somewhere else, he wins the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And he shoves it down all those haters' throats. Because, honestly, for anybody to say that this kid sucks when he is doing everything to keep this team afloat is pathetic. It's pathetic. It's hatred. And I don't care what Stephen A. Smith and, and Shannon Sharp says on their show, saying that they shouldn't sign Dak. Who, what do they know? And, by the way, Stephen A. Smith is the biggest cowboy hater. Okay? <laughs> Why would anybody listen to Stephen A. Smith when it comes to the Cowboys? By the way, Beav. Uh, He's a giant fan. By the way, Beav, how did your boy Trey Lance do in his last preseason game with the five interceptions that he threw? I just think it's pathetic. And the Cowboy fans don't realize what they have until it's gone. And I said this about the Giant fans when Eli Manning was gone. Mm-hmm. Everybody was like, oh, thank God, he's done, blah, 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 blah. A lot of Giant fans couldn't stand him until he won his first Super Bowl in 2007. As a matter of fact, people were talking about trading him in 2006, moving on from him after two years when they drafted him. Oh, this guy stinks. We should have kept Kurt Warner. (laughs) Then he goes on a run. They beat the undefeated Patriots, and everybody's like, oh, my God, (laughs) we love Eli. He's the greatest. He's the best thing since sliced bread. Give me a break. Yeah, it's reactionary ridiculous. New York fans. That's what they it's always ridiculous. do. It's ridiculous. Overreacted for what have we done to me lately? You it's said the joke. same things with the Yankee fans. Uh, Keith, yeah, you're one of the best O lines in his first four seasons. Okay, that's fine. In the league at that time, that doesn't make you better than Nate Newton and Larry Allen and even Jay Novacek at tight end was a good blocker. Like, that doesn't make it th- that offensive line. I know Zach Martin and Tyron Smith are going to be future Hall of Famers too, but that was one of the, arguably the best who offensive was- line in NFL history. Who was the who was Dak throwing the ball to when he became when he was a rookie? First of all, that's Bryant and an old James. Troy <laughs> Aikman was a first round draft pick. Okay, Dak Prescott was a fourth round draft pick. He came out of nowhere, and the fact that they found him is pretty unbelievable. Because by the way, Jerry Jones is not very good at drafting players. Okay, he's just not. And the fact that they found Dak Prescott in the fourth round, and Dak is better than a competent quarterback. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to say it again. For anybody to think that he's not a tier one quarterback, you don't know football, okay? And that's all I'm going to say. You don't know football because this guy putting up 
How many seasons of 4,000 or more yards and telling me he's not a tier one quarterback is ridiculous. It's the same thing when you talk about Kirk Cousins. Yeah, he's not a winner. He doesn't know how to win. And a lot of Minnesota Viking fans couldn't stand him. And they were very happy that he was gone and he went to Atlanta. Well, who's filling in for him this year? Sam Donald? You're, you're going to sell me Sam Donald. I know all about Sam, okay? I'm a Jet fan. I'm not expect. I hope Sam has a good season, but I'm not going to bet on it. And JJ McCarthy, are you? Do we want to go back? I don't know if anybody's seen that. Uh, the Netflix, um, the fl- untold story on the the what what, what was happening? Uh, I forget what the Michigan scandal. The Michigan scandal, yeah. stealing signs, st- sign stealing. Yeah. I watched it today, by the way. Hmm. Very interesting. Very very interesting. And we will get into that on Thursday because I'm not. We we're not speaking about it today. But I'm going to tell you this right now. Steedy Lamb definitely was the first person that should have been signed. The second, Dak Prescott. Third, you either decide you're going to do something with Micah Parsons or you move on from Micah. Because Micah already came out and said, yo, you don't want to sign me? Trade me to Pittsburgh. So why don't you oblige him? Why don't you oblige him? Give him what he wants. Because the Steelers are actually a smart organization that's going to make it hard for them. (laughs) Here's the thing. The Steelers have draft stock. They have some good young players. If they give them what they want, you're going to probably have to give away at least two first-round draft picks and maybe two seconds and and probably a third for Micah, especially how young he is and how great he is at his position. But go look at Micah Parsons' numbers in the second half of the season. They're nowhere close to the first half of the season. Nowhere close. Mm-hmm. Go look at him. Yep, and that's the problem when you have a team, a guy that actively says, oh, I want to go get traded to this team. You're going to lose leverage at that point. The Steelers are a smart organization. They're going to take advantage of Jerry Jones doing that. They're going to wait it out, let the price drop, and then go for him then. And then you really want that if you're the Cowboys either. Oh, the great GM of Jerry Jones is going to want that kind of thing. No, and saying that about CeeDee Lamb's contract, when it took forever for you to sign him, yeah, you didn't have to make him the highest paid receiver in the NFL, but still, like, you waited forever. You could have gotten really bad, and now you have to give him the $100 million guarantee. That doesn't make you a good GM, Jerry Jones. Micah Parsons played 17 games last year. In the first 10 games, he had 11 sacks. 11 sacks in his first 10 games. Go look at what he did in his last seven games. Mm-hmm. I think this is that Bills game. He got broken. He has not. He He's not good in the second half. And in the playoffs, go look at his numbers in the playoffs. Go look at his numbers. As great as Micah Parsons is for all you Cowboy fans that want to get on your hands and knees and give him a sucky sucky. Yeah, I think the only suck good, him like a lollipop. I think the only good Speed game would do that, right? I think the only good game he had in the playoffs was that second matchup with the 49ers where the Cowboys almost won that one before George Kittle had that big catch. That was probably the only playoff matchup Micah Parsons looked like Micah Parsons. Micah Parsons is a great player. Nobody's taking that away from him. But to say uh, all the Cowboy fans think he's the best thing since sliced bread. And bo- before the second half of the season, everybody was saying that he was the best defensive player in the league. They were arguing it was either him or TJ Watt. What happened in the second half? T.J. Watt was still beasting before he got hurt. Right. And Michael Parsons fell off, off the radar. He wasn't even in the top three. That tells you. I don't know what anybody has not seen when it comes to that play. That doesn't take away how great Michael Parsons is. Is he a top five defensive player? He is. He is. But you're not going to pay him over a quarterback that is very hard to find. They don't grow on trees. Go ask the Jets. <laughs> They don't actually. They do grow on trees. They just don't grow. They don't bloom. Okay. All right. You can also ask the Browns or the Bears. They're not the brightest with the quarterback position either. <laughs> they uh, rot. And, and Keith, to answer your question about you overrate the Steelers, I'm not saying the Steelers roster. I'm talking about the Steelers organization is not going to just cater to Jerry Jones. Say, oh, here's uh, two first round picks because Micah Parsons wants to go here. No, the Steelers have not been fleeced in very many trades, and they're going to make it very hard on Jerry Jones to do that. Again, and Keith says Cousins is another good regular season quarterback. Okay. How many good playoff quarterbacks are there? Everybody, like, blows up Justin Herbert. Oh, my God. That guy's amazing. And what has he done in the playoffs? I I saw a complete debacle of him and the Chargers against Trevor Lawrence. I remember that. How about Trevor Lawrence? Everybody loves Trevor Lawrence. He got 50-something million dollars. Last year, they were leading their division all season long. And in the last three games, all they had to do was win one they lost all three of them, and they missed out on the playoffs. Why? Because Trevor Lawrence played like crap, and they paid him $55 million in the offseason. 
it's also, again, you're judging all these quarterbacks that don't have these large sample sizes in the playoffs either to be able to say, oh, this guy's a proven good regular season quarterback that stuck to the playoffs. But at the same time, like Dak Prescott, going back to him, like he's had enough good, even good playoff losses too. his first season against the Packers, who were the hottest team in the NFL at the time, not the best team, but the hottest. They were down 21 to three in that game. Dak Prescott rallies back to tie the game before Aaron Rodgers made that insane throw to Jared Cook. They won the game. Fine. That's not Dak Prescott's fault. They lost 34 31. They, he has the best game of the playoffs against the Seahawks Legion of Boom defense, which, by the way, I lost a bet on thanks to the, the, that, that game. And they, some of the, besides those 49ers games, he's played well in every playoff game. There's too much hate. Okay. There's too many people that hate on Dak Prescott for some damn reason. And C.D. Lamb deserved the money, and I think yes. Dak is probably the most happy and most excited one out of all of them. Why? Because he gets his best weapon back, and he needs them for the season because they don't have much. So I believe has been, you know, the best, you know, you know, push for C.D. Lamb to get his contract. I'm sure Dak reached out to Jerry Jones. Dak was the one that pushed this contract through because he knows he has no chance in hell on even making the playoffs without C.D. Lamb this year because they don't have anything. They did nothing for him in the offseason. And I could go back and talk about Daniel Jones, too. What did the Giants do this offseason that has benefited Daniel Jones' success? Bringing in Malik neighbors? They lost Saquon Barkley, their best weapon. He's over there playing for the, the Eagles. We'll see how that works out. The fact is, you have to look at what the Cowboys are and what they have been in a five-year stint. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If Dak Prescott wasn't on this team, are they a playoff team? Not even close. If Dak Prescott didn't put up the numbers over year after year after year, are they a playoff team? That tells you how important Dak Prescott is to a franchise. Hence the reason why he's going to get $60 million. If it's not from the Cowboys, it'll be from somebody else. You best believe it, baby. I'm going to tell you this right now. If it's not from the Cowboys, I'm going to tell you at least 10 teams next year will be lining up for Dak Prescott to come to their fr franchise, their roster. Yeah, they're already a fringe team as it is with the playoffs with everything they lost in the offseason on defense. And again, maybe Mike Zimmer changes that. Maybe some of these draft picks work out fine. But like they're having to trust their passing game to do a lot. And that's why they had to make this deal done with C.D. Lamb. I'm not going to give Jerry Jones extra credit for saying, oh, we finally got the deal done and we didn't have to pay him the highest paid wide receiver. Okay, fine. You have to make him the highest paid wide receiver. You did what you're supposed to do. It doesn't give you any point They didn't even GM. make him the highest paid no, they, wide they receiver. Didn't, luckily, they didn't have to. I thought it might have gotten to that point. He but took it, less money. Yeah. Even so, like Dak Prescott and C.D. Lamb are going to have to carry that team because Ezekiel Elliott's 29 years old. Their offensive line is still decent, but there's still question marks on it. And like you said, they don't have enough outside receiving depth to make that work. Brandon Cooks is older. Like, he's going to start regressing soon. He's an 800, 900 yard guy. He's fine, but like, he's nothing special. Like, give me a break. Yeah, he's 32. That's what you're going to sell a, He's to the 32 Cowboy years fans? old and a smaller guy. Like, he has flaws in his game. Like, he's fine, but he's nothing special. Then you have, all, like you said, all these gadget players, Jalen Tolbert and Kavante Turpin. These are all like special teams type guys. I remember when receivers. he, when Tolbert ran in for a touchdown, a pump return last year. Everybody was like, he's the other guy. He's the other guy. And what did he do after that? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. I'm sure the same people nothing. were saying. I'm sure the same people that were saying the same thing about the. By the way, recently cut Kadarius Tony. Oh, that's another joke. <laughs> uh, he'll probably go to the Cowboys because the Cowboys like bringing oh, in players. <laughs> like to bring in players that mean absolutely nothing when it comes to an NFL roster. We've seen that by the Cowboys. Oh yeah, many many times. So hey, yo, let, let's bring in Kadarius Tony. We're. Uh, Allen Robinson gets waved by the Giants. Yep. We'll bring in Allen Robinson. That'll sure. work. <laughs> That'll fit. They should. And I'm, I'm going to be the first person. Is I'll be the, the last person to say this because I know a lot of Capitol fans didn't like it. They should have never moved Amari Cooper. Mm -hmm. They should have never moved. That's enough for a fifth round pick. <laughs> they should have never. Because Amari Cooper is still an elite wide receiver in this league. And CeeDee Lamb, yes, he developed into that sensational player that they thought he was going to be. But to have a guy like Amari Cooper right beside him, I think the Cowboys go to a Super Bowl. I think they, they're they absolutely in a Super Bowl one of these years if they still had Amari Cooper. It's crazy to think Amari Cooper is like not even 30 yet. It's, <laughs> it it's unbelievable. Been in the league forever. <laughs> it, it's, it really is ridiculous. And it's a shame because the Cowboys had the weapons they needed to get over the hump. And it just didn't, you know, Jerry Jones overpaid. I mean, he overpaid Amari Cooper at the time. Amari Cooper was making all of all, at the time, $100 million. He was the highest paid wide receiver in all of football. Was he the best wide receiver in football? He wasn't. 
It didn't make any sense. These contracts make no sense. If he brought in a real executive, and I'm not blaming all of this on Jerry Jones, okay? It's not only Jerry Jones. It's the people he has around him. The people that are his voice. When they're, when they're sitting in a, you know, in a round table and there's like, I don't know, 10 executives, a VP, a president, and all these other guys that he has, his sons, they're all speaking with him and giving him information. He's going to take that information and use it for his team, his organization. They're, they're obviously not spitting the right crap out to him because he's making mistake after mistake after mistake. So you can't blame just Jerry Jones. It's the executives he has around him. Maybe he needs to fire him. Uh, Snug says, yeah, I remember when Doc ran out the clock at the end of the playoff game. Yeah, he made okay. mistakes. All right, fine. You want to say he, you, you want to blame him for that mistake? Fine. Six, two-thirds of that was on him. What about Mike McCarthy calling a quarterback draw with no timeouts? That was not exactly a great play call. Either. Everybody's going to blame the quarterback, and I think Dak needs to understand, no matter what, the quarterback's going to get all the credit when they win, and when they lose, the, the quarterback's going to get all the attacks. And he knows that. Because the quarterback position is the number one position in, in really professional sports. And everybody looks at it and is like, whoever is winning, like Tom Brady, say whatever you want. Now, Tom Brady, sensational playoff player. There's no question that he is. Tom Brady had a lot of great players around him, but no, everybody forgets that. But Tom Brady gets all the credit because he's the quarterback. And Tom Brady's going to get all the attacks, including they lost in 2007 to the New York Giants. They're going to they're gonna attack Tom Brady for some of the mistakes that he made in the second half of the game. And Tom Brady would tell you that he would give up any one of those Super Bowl championships to take back that 2007 loss to the New York Giants. He has already said that multiple times in many different areas. Keith says, you have no idea if they go to a Super Bowl with Cooper. There was no point in trading Amari Cooper two years ago who was 27 years old for a fifth round pick. You didn't have to pay CD lamb at the time you had to pay Dak. You had to pay DeMarcus Lawrence. And that was it. Like everyone else who had, it was attainable. They could have kept Cooper and lamb and kept that a good receiver. You're going to tell me right now against San Francisco. If they had Amari Cooper, they don't beat San Francisco because the game was really, really close. Mm -hmm. You're going to tell me right now, if they didn't have Amari Cooper, they don't beat San Francisco. Absolutely do. Absolutely do beat San Francisco. That's a fact. And you could take that to the bank. So you, you could say whatever you want. We'll never know. It will never. There's no argument to that. We will never be able to argue that because we'll never know. It never happened. Yeah. You're but Amari Cooper, I mean, go look at the Amari, Amari Cooper's numbers over there with the Browns. They're ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You're going to tell me if Amari and CD right now are playing on the same team? They wouldn't be the best tandem in the league. They would be. Amari Cooper has better numbers with like a not as good Deshaun Watson and all the quarterbacks they rotated with last year and whatever they had the year before, too. And he's still been steadily better than all the Cowboys number two receivers. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> and anybody that's going to sit here and argue with us about this. And that's just because everybody hates Dak Prescott. And that's fine. You want to hate him? Hate him. It's it's fine. But you're not gonna you're not gonna have me sit here today and say, you know what? See, Dak Prescott sucks. Because I'm not gonna do that. I am a very big Dak Prescott supporter. And one of the main reasons why is I just look at the game and everybody says it's the eye test. The eye test would tell you that Dak is a good quarterback. I don't know what you guys are blinded to see. Oh, it's uh, all the yards and all the touchdowns that he throws is at the end of no, that's not true. That's a lie. That's not true. Okay, so stop it. And I don't care what any of the Cowboy fans, including the Beef, who <laughs> at one point said that Dak Prescott was going to win not one, not two, but three Super Bowls in a row. And now all of a sudden he can't stand them. He sucks. He stinks. Maybe he'll deal with another team. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I can't wait until September 5th because I, I will bring up Dak Prescott in front of all those Long Islander fans who can't stand Cowboy fans and, and, and Cowboys and Cowboy Nation. Because they could say whatever they want. And I'm not going to sit here and mate and beat around a bush. And I'll say it again. Dak Prescott on my list is a top five quarterback in the league. Number five. And I will continue to say that. Do I would I take Dak over Lamar? Absolutely. Absolutely. What has Lamar done in the playoffs? Don't give me this crap. It's all about what you're doing in the playoffs. I can name a bunch of elite quarterbacks that are not good in the playoffs. A bunch. Including Peyton Manning. On the Pat McAfee show, Bill Belichick said he has doubts about whether Drake May or any rookie quarterback should be starting. Belichick added 
that you can't judge quarterbacks by preseason play because schemes are so much simpler than the preseason games. Jared Mayo says that May has outplayed Jacoby Brissett in the preseason, but he will choose his starter based on the entire body of work through training camp. Tom Brady mentioned last week that he doesn't believe rookie quarterbacks should start right away. Three out of the five first-round draft picks were named starters besides Michael Penix and J.J. McCarthy. May was 13 of 20 passing for 126 yards and a touchdown in the Patriots' final preseason game. First of all, okay, I know a lot of Patriot fans want to see uh, Jacoby Brissett as your, their starting quarterback, but you're not going to see that because Jacoby Brissett is not healthy. If he was, there could be arguments to it. Drake May is the best option for the New England Patriots. He is. You picked a quarterback in your top three in the first round. You have to start. You have to. And they have nobody. Jacoby Brissett is a competent quarterback. He is not a number one quarterback. He's a number two on any other roster. You're going to start a number two this season when you want to see what you have at the quarterback position. It could take Drake May 10 games to figure things out. It doesn't matter. You need to know in the next two years, is this the guy that's going to take my franchise to the next level? You had it with Tom Brady for 20 some odd years. You need to see if Drake May's the guy. You cannot. And I know everybody's going to say, well, look at Jordan Love. He was a first round draft. He was a late first round draft. Look at Aaron Rodgers. He was a first round. He was a late first round draft pick. When you draft a quarterback, and everybody's going to say, well, what about Michael Penix? Nobody in their wildest dreams believed that at Atlanta this year, after bringing in a guy like Kirk Cousins, they were going to draft a quarterback in the top 10. Nobody. Not even Kirk Cousins believed that was going to happen. He was shocked. He probably crapped his pants when it happened. He had no idea that Michael Penix was on their radar. Nobody. But the fact is, you have a quarterback in the top five, you got to start him. You have to. Now, I don't know. What type of quarterback Drake May is going to be in the NFL? I know he was successful for the North Carolina. We've seen a lot of North Carolina quarterbacks come out of the draft and not succeed, a.k.a. Mitchell Trubisky, who was a top three pick, failed by the Chicago Bears after trading up for him. It, they, they've done a lot of mistakes and made a lot of mistakes over the last couple of years when it comes to quarterback play, including Justin Fields. I think I think the two organizations that have been absolutely rocky when it comes to drafting quarterbacks is Chicago and the Jets. And the Browns. That's uh, Chicago and the Jets. <laughs> I, I, I just got to speak the truth here. Top five picks in many, many different years, and none of them turned out to be anything. But the fact is, Bill Belichick on the Pat McAfee show coming out and saying that, you know, Drake May or any rookie quarterback should not be starting. You would take advice from one of the greatest coaches, if not the greatest coach of all time. My question to a guy like Bill Belichick, why did you bring Tom Brady in so early? That would be my question. Tom Brady, what was it? What did it take? What, one year? One year and he was the starting quarterback in the New England Patriots because Drew Bledsoe went down. It was a freak accident. But why did you bring in a rookie quarterback? What? You, you're, you're smarter than the average bear? You're smarter than everybody else? Is that why? And I know that Bill Belichick was not happy that Gerard Mayo is taking over for his New England Patriots. I I believe even though he drafted Gerard Mayo and he likes Gerard Mayo, he was on his he was on his coaching staff. Uh, he was his defensive coordinator. He was his linebacker coach when he retired from the NFL. I know Bill Belichick was not happy that the Patriots decided to go within and bring in one of his disciples in Gerard Mayo because he knows Gerard Mayo is going to fail. I know Gerard Mayo is going to fail. I think everybody and their mother knows Gerard Mayo is going to fail. Does Drake May? I don't know if I would trust an ex-linebacker to be my coach. I'm sorry. And everybody's going to, well, Bill Belichick was a defensive-minded coach, but he was under Bill Parcells. He was, uh, he was, you know, on the coaching staff for Tom Coughlin and Sean Payton. Great offensive minds. Worked with so many great, you know, coaching minds over the years. The fact is, where the quarterback is, now these days, are a lot more faster when it comes to developing than they were in those days. Training is different. Now, obviously, there's more practicing then, and the pre there was more preseason games, and you, you you would be able to hit during OTAs. You can't do that anymore. It's a different 
It's different, you know, protection for players and all that other stuff. But these guys year round are training year round. Do you think in the eighties and the nineties, you got guys like Joe Montana and Steve Young after the season is over they're they're training in facilities, throwing footballs day in and day out, playing and practicing with the players on their roster, going to, you know, private islands and throw footballs with the players that they are. No, none of them did that. It's different now. It's a year round experience. These youngsters need to develop faster. They're training. They got their own personal trainers. They got team trainers. They're doing more now than they ever have. So they develop quicker. That's what I think. Now, it depends on the personality too. It really does. I don't know Drake May in a hole in a wall. I see what Tom Brady turned into and how smart he was and how he saw things on the football field that other quarterbacks couldn't see. When you have a player like that, yes, they're gifted. You don't need to really train them or teach them what they see audible at the line of scrimmage. If you watched the dynasty, Tom Brady was such a fast learner. As a matter of fact, Bill Belichick could, couldn't believe at practices how fast he saw plays and how they broke down as fast as they did. There are not many players like that. Peyton Manning studied it as a kid at, at the age of 14, 13 years old. If you watch his documentary, he was he was watching football. He was watching his father play, watching how he called the plays at the line of scrimmage. He he learned the game through different coaches and 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 sitting on the sidelines where his father was the, the lead quarterback, the starting quarterback for the Saints. He studied the game. A lot of these guys are just born with so many gifts, and they don't realize that they need to study the game just as much as any of them if they're going to become the players or the, the quarterbacks that they looked up to. Aaron Rodgers is just a gifted player. He's gifted. He could throw the ball. He slings the ball sideways, front ways. I, I mean, when you got guys like Patrick Mahomes, they're just pure gifted athletes. It makes the game slow down for them a lot faster. A lot of these quarterbacks, Mr. Trubisky was a good quarterback in college. He couldn't develop his skills in the NFL. Trevor Lawrence, say whatever you want. He hasn't developed into the player that everybody thought he was going to. CJ Stroud was unbelievable last year. Let's see if he could do it his second year when everybody's got tape on him. Quarterbacks are a dime a dozen. From every five quarterbacks drafted in the first round, one of them become elite quarterbacks one if if lucky you have a better chance of finding a quarterback in the later rounds than you do in the first the way these statistics would show you go look at the last 10 years of first round quarterbacks numbers would tell you about five of them became elite quarterbacks in the nfl five five of them in 10 years became elite quarterbacks some of them we don't even know what they are jordan love we still Time would only tell what Jordan Love is going to be. Lance Sherry was fantastic in his first year as a starting quarterback after sitting behind Aaron Rodgers for three. We don't know what these guys are going to transition or become as NFL players. What we do know is the league is what have you done for me lately. That's what it is. And for Drake May, he has a chance in the next two years to prove that he's competent and he could be a quarterback that you can win with. Or you could be like Daniel. You could be like Daniel Jones. Everybody's trying to throw away, or another Jones that they threw away last year. Yeah, and that's the thing with I think the situation that the Patriots are in because I think whether they start him right away or start him like quickly in the season, I don't think it really matters at that point. You still need to have him test himself with these bad situations. You're not going to go anywhere this year anyway. Like the Patriots, not in that division, not, not not in the AFC in general. Like you're probably on paper besides the Broncos, maybe, maybe the Broncos are worse, but like they're the second worst roster right now in the AFC. It's not going to get anywhere. And I compare two situations with this Jared Goff for one of them. They, when, this is before McVay got there. They had the worst receiving core in the league and Jeff Fisher, an old school coach running the team and Jared Goff. He didn't start right away, but he still started relatively quickly and got to learn the game that way with Todd Gurley, with an okay offensive line. The Patriots are built very similar. They have good running game at max. They have a not great offensive line, but they can simplify the game for him to be able to learn. He still has to learn how to read defense. He still has to learn rhythm type offenses. And then maybe they get the offensive coach to help him out after that. How about like we were talking about with the Dolphins last week with Tua, like Tua got wrongfully benched at certain points. Fine. But he still got to learn the game by playing at least. And then he got the weapons to help him out. Josh Allen, the same thing with Stefan Diggs, Josh Allen played. He didn't start right away the first year, but he played by week three. He had that 
infamous game against the Vikings where he hurdled the, uh, the defender. And he played the rest of the season with John Brown and Emmanuel Sanders and guys like that. Robert Foster, like these aren't great receivers. Why can't Drake May, who's not a super raw prospect, deserve a chance like that? And, and Tom Brady coming out and saying what he said, Tom Brady was a rookie quarterback when he started in the NFL, all because of a freak accident to Drew Bledsoe. Mm-hmm. It was a freak accident in the middle of the season. Nobody would have thought that Tom Brady was going to step on a football field. Well, thank the Jets for that. Of all the teams that could have hurt Drew Bledsoe at the time that they did, it was the New York Jets because that started the Brady era. The Jets did. Yeah. Started the Brady era. It was funny. The one Jets game I ever went to was against the Patriots, and they were actually honoring Mo Lewis that day. <laughs> that, that, that never happened. I would never honor Mo Lewis. That, that's the guy that started all this crap, all these Super Bowl championships that the Patriots have won. And I'm not going to take it away. There are a lot of people. I'm watching so many different documentaries with Tom Brady. So many of them. And, and Tom Brady, it, it, you see his high school coaches, you see even his middle school coaches and what they said about him. He was a great catcher, had a great arm. He could have been a professional baseball player. But would he have become a baseball superstar like he has with the NFL? I, I Probably not. I mean, what he's done in the NFL, he became arguably the greatest player to ever play in, in NFL history. So what I'm trying to say here is, some people will take what Tom Brady says for with a grain of salt. They will. And then some people would sit there and say, Tom is hating. Tom is going to speak whatever he wants to speak because he believes, because his, his success in the NFL and what he has seen in the NFL, that he is right and everybody else and all these GMs and all these executives and organizations are wrong. What I believe is, obviously, Bill Belichick, who – is behind Tom Brady stating that rookies should not start, that they should be sitting behind uh, a veteran quarterback. I'm, I'm going to go back to what you believe in. If you draft a quarterback in your top five in your first round or top 10, you believe that this guy can step on a football field and put up decent numbers and help your, ch- help your team win a game. If you're not believing that this guy can step in and win a football game right off the bat, don't draft them in the first round. Draft them in in the later rounds. Draft them at the end of the first round. Why are you going to take a chance? Usually, if you're drafted in the top 10, you're starting. You're starting. That's just the way football works. Look at Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson was drafted in the top three from the New York Jets. He was the number two pick. The Jets gave him all the chances in the world to succeed. All the chances for three years, for all the craziness that's happened with the injury of Aaron Rodgers, he had a chance to step on the field and and take the Jets to the playoffs with the talent that they had, the defense that they had, and he failed. So the Jets said, you know what, we're done with this. Off the field situation, the issues that he has on the field and off the field that the players didn't even really like him. He's he's like really like a Russell Wilson, okay? The players in the locker room, when when Mike, what's his name again, was on the team. uh, Mike White. Mike White was on the team. When he was the starting quarterback, they were wearing Mike White t-shirts on the plane. Yeah. I know that pissed off Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson was traded to the Broncos this offseason. He didn't make the team. He's probably not making another roster. Zach Wilson's stint in the NFL as a top three pick is over. He'll be in the CFL, the XFL, <laughs> or wherever the FL is. He will not be in the NFL anymore. Can't wait for West to have CFL bets on Zach Wilson. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just speaking the truth. He's, he, I, I'm happy for him. He's engaged. He's happy. He, he bought his uh, future wife a beautiful one and a half million dollar ring. <laughs> I mean, he better save up on, on that money because that money is pretty much gone in the next couple of years if he just throws it away on a freaking ring. Okay, so I just think that, you know, you don't know what these guys are going to turn out to be. But if the Jets waited, if the Jets waited with Zach Wilson for three years. Had him sitting on the bench, and I don't know who their starting quarterback would have been. I don't know. Cooper. I don't know. Cooper. What, what's the guy on the yeah, Cowboys? Cooper, Cooper Rush. Cooper Rush. Cooper Rush was their starting quarterback for three years, backing he, and Zach Wilson was backing him up. Does anybody believe that Zach Wilson would be a better quarterback after the fact? No. We've seen enough of Zach Wilson. Jordan Love. At least what they were seeing on the practice field and what Aaron was saying on the practice field, everybody knew that Jordan Love was going to be a good quarterback in the league. It's just a matter of how much or how good he was going to be and how the Cow- uh, how the Cow- how the Green Bay Packers 
were going to bring him in after the fact Aaron Rodgers was going to be traded. Uh, before we get our guest on quickly, uh, Keith says uh, his line sucks. Brady had a lot more protection and talent than May has. Okay, but I go back to Jared Goff, whose Rams team did not have a great line. And I go back to Josh Allen, his rookie year. The Bills team didn't have a great line and had two of the worst receiving cores in the league. And I think when you look at that kind of situation, Keith, you could still let him learn through that. I'm not everyone who's saying that, all right, you don't want him. You don't want him to be hit and stuff like that. That's fine. You could still simplify the offense and do more quick concepts in today's NFL. Like I think you look at like rookie quarterbacks, they're not raw prospects. I, Jordan love had to sit cause he was raw. Jo Drake may is not that same kind of case. Josh Allen had to sit a little because he was a bit raw, but he started week three. Like give these guys time. They're we'll good see. prospects. He thinks Michael Penix is going to be a good quarterback sitting behind Kirk cousins. Watch Kirk Cousins gets hurt early in the season, and I, I'm willing to bet you Michael Penix is going to come in and he's going to fail. He's going to fail. If you think Michael Penix is going to sit behind Kirk Cousins and he's just going to step on the football field and he's going to become an elite quarterback, good luck. Good luck, Keith. That's not going to work. And it's not always based on that philosophy either, Keith. And he like, is a pocket quarterback. Yeah. And it's changed now. Pocket quarterbacks, as much as everybody looks for those – Th those pocket quarterbacks in the past, they're not looking for those guys. They're looking for mobile, dual-threat quarterbacks like Jalen Hurts, like those type of guys, Trevor Lawrence, and all these guys. Th you know, there are guys like Joe Burrow that have succeeded succeeded in the NFL as early as they have because they're they're good prospects and they're good pocket-present quarterbacks. But not many of them now have really developed into these elite quarterbacks that we're talking about or we've mentioned over the last couple of weeks. So. And, and again, you also look at the, like, Penix, who he is. Like, he's he's a veteran guy. Like, he's been in college football for a while as well. He has some traits that are very raw as well, but that doesn't mean he couldn't succeed if he started, not necessarily with the Falcons, because, again, they weren't going to, he wasn't going to start for the Falcons, but if he got drafted to a spot that had good guys already to try to put him in there. That's the same thing we were saying with the Dolphins before we knew Tua was going to be signed. Like, they could plug a rookie quarterback in with those receivers. And now with the Vikings with J.J. McCarthy before he got hurt. The Patriots are in a different case right now where they have to let Drake May experiment, let, let him learn adversity and do stuff With like that. With nothing on the field, because if you have somebody that can find players, especially with the weapons he doesn't have, and he turns those guys into pretty competent players, then you know you can go out the next year and bring in big-name players, like a Brandon Ayuk if he becomes available, right. or any of these other guys, which can change the team's fortunes for the future. Which so. is the same thing Josh Allen did. Josh Allen rebirthed John Brown and Emmanuel Sanders, two veteran guys. He had Robert Foster, an undrafted free agent, an overweight Kelvin Benjamin his first year. Like That takes adversity to be able to make those guys at least competent. The Bills were supposed to be the worst team in football, and they were still competitive. Uh, anyways, when we come back ladies and gentlemen our first guest will be talking to former Colts and Broncos defensive end Daryl Reef. This is the sports loud now. I don't drink a lot of milk. No I won't. I'm not licking anyone. I don't drink a lot of milk. 672 3108 is the number to call. You're listening to the sports loud mouth. I'm your host Daryl Marks my co-host Speedy PD. Go to our website at www.worldwidesportsradio.com Check out all our shows throughout the week, including The Loud Mouth with me and Speedy Petey every single Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. All you have to do to tune in and check out all our local listings for all our shows is go to our website at www.worldwidesportsradio.com. Not a lot of sports on tonight. It, it's, it's unbelievable. This is the worst time for sports. But guess what? Football's two weeks away. You have hockey, what, three weeks away. Basketball, three to four weeks away. And then everything, college footballs, it started this week. Next week, it's going to explode. So everything is, is starting to impact uh, everything that we're going to be talking about on the show. And this guy, he's been on our show before. We're very happy to have him on the show. We're now talking to former Colts and Broncos defensive end, Daryl Reed. Daryl, what's up, buddy? Hey, what's going on? How's it going? How's it going? We're good, man. How's it going with you? You look good. You look healthy. Oh, I can't complain at all. I can't complain at all. Well, I can. I can complain. I'm actually in Denver right now. I'm in. Really? Wow. That's a great. That's some great shots. There you go, man. You look good. You look healthy. <laughs> and, you're wearing, and you're wearing a Yankees hat, so I love you even no, more. No, no. This is actually a Baltimore hat. No, I no, think. no. In the picture. In the picture. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I wear, listen, I'm not loyal to any baseball team. You're not loyal to any baseball team. What what, what team as far, did you grow as far up as hats, rooting for? As far as hats. Okay. Well, I, 
but I, but you won't catch me in a Red Sox hat. Let's let's not get. All let's, right. Okay. All right. I like you. I like you even more now because <laughs> I'm a hat guy too. I wear a lot of hats, but I only wear my teams. I wear a Jets hat. I have all different color Jets hats. I wear uh, the Yankees hats. I have all different colors. You name it. I wear Jordan they, hats. They I wear had the hats. biggest selection of colors. Oh no question. Yeah, no question. I mean, it's the Yankees. Come on. I, what can I say? I mean, we're, we're here in New York. You got to come out here and hang out with some Yankee fans. I heard you guys talk about quarterbacks earlier, right? Yes. And, yes. And, and, you know, and and I agree with you. Like, you know, the the, t- the prototypical pocket quarterback is for the most part over. But there are a few exceptions. You, mm-hmm. you mentioned a couple, Joe Burrow. But look at Bo Nix out in Denver or mm-hmm. where I'm at right now in Denver. Mm-hmm. You know, where that was Sean Payton's guy. That's who he was looking for. That's who he wanted. I like Bo Nix, and I've I've been saying it over and over again, and people might think I'm crazy, but I always get backlash on this show. I think Bo Nix was the second best quarterback in this draft class. I've been saying it. I I still think Caleb Williams is the number one guy, but after Caleb Williams, you can argue who is going to be that other guy that's going to show up. I think Bo Nix, because of Sean Payton, because of the – the situation that he is in with one of the best quarterback gurus in NFL history. Right. That plays as well. Yes. It it plays very well. And I I think that he picked up, he picked his guy. Russell Wilson was not his guy. He inherited Russell Wilson. I think now Bo Nix being in the position that he is, I think Bo Nix will succeed. And plus Bo Nix was in college football for four years. And usually. Yeah. He's well, and and he's older on top of that. Yes, I, I think that if you look at the success of quarterbacks that played four years in college, it's much better than the quarterbacks that played three years or even three, two and a half years in college and go to the NFL. So you're saying lot. early on in their career, obviously. Yes, yes, right, yes. Right, right. And I, I think that when you go back, and, and, and that's what I want to get into it with it first with you, is Bill Belichick came out and said something very, very interesting on the Pat McAfee show. And he said that uh, rookie quarterbacks should, be, should not be starting. Now, your opinion with with the way the NFL works now Mm -hmm. and being that you're drafting a a quarterback in the top 10, Mm -hmm. do you sit him and let him sit behind a quarterback for three years after you know that you could be on the hot seat in one year or two years and not even have your quarterback step in behind the the line of scrimmage? What are your thoughts to that? So so let let me say this, right? And it's easy for Bill to say that, right? Because – one thing's for sure, two things for certain, Bill's job wasn't on the line every year. Mm-hmm. So some coaches are in a different position than other coaches to allow the time for a number one draft pick to sit. Some coaches, they have their, their jobs on the line, you know, so they have to throw that quarterback into the fire and it's, and it's sink or swim. And most of the time, rookie quarterbacks in the NFL, it's the NFL. It's, the, it's top NFL defenses and you're a rookie. You're seeing them for the first time. It's not like college. The coverages are way tighter. The windows are way smaller, right? Mm. So on a whole, most rookie quarterbacks struggle on a whole. You do have, I mean, even, even last year you had an exception, right? Um, down down in the Texas. So it's but it's rare, right? It's it's rare. And and like you said, on a, for the most part, those quarterbacks are a little bit more. I, I don't know. Their 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 style is a little bit more mature. Is mm-hmm. that is that what you would say? Is yes. that yes? You know, um, but on a whole, mo- most rookie quarterbacks struggle. I mean, you know, look at you know, I played with one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, and he he broke the league record in interceptions his rookie year, right? So, um, but at that time, he he was the franchise, so they were in a position that you know, I think it was Jim Harbaugh back then where he could play him and not worry about his job, you know? So I, I think that plays a factor for some coaches in that decision. Bill Belichick, he has, you know, he's in a position where he can let, you know, a Tom Brady sit for years. or And Tom Brady wasn't a number one pick either. So um, it, it depends. It's situational. It's situational. I mean, we talk about Atlanta, you know, that, that, that coaching situation – I think I think he's going to play sooner than people think. Hmm. 
Very interesting. So you actually playing with Peyton Manning at the time, like you said, he was a, a younger quarterback. No, and... I did. I did not play with Peyton when he was young. No. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, you mentioned you mentioned that as a, as a younger as a younger quarterback, like he had he was like forcing the ball. And Tom Brady actually said something interesting last week, where like he said, rookie quarterbacks and young quarterbacks don't have as much control of their offenses because of the schemes. Do you think that kind of thing too, especially with these new offensive coaches? 